This is the Read to Lead Podcast, Episode 505. When you're a family first entrepreneur, you prioritize time over money. You're not trying to grow, grow, grow that business just to see it as large as you can build it. Most entrepreneurs start a business seeking freedom, but end up in a prison of 100 hour work weeks isolated from their family. Instead, how about letting go of the hustle and embracing a family first mindset? Hi, I'm Jeff, and this is the Read to Lead podcast, the podcast that's dedicated to your personal and professional growth. If you want to achieve true success in business and in life, it begins with developing a consistent and intentional reading habit. And that's what this podcast is designed to help you do. Like what books should you be paying attention to in the first place? Well, this podcast is a good place to start. And that includes today's author and book. The author is Steve Chu, and he's written a book called The Family First Entrepreneur, How to Achieve Financial Freedom Without Sacrificing What Matters Most. I'll be asking Steve what he's learned the last 15 years about the lies of the hustle, how he recommends validating your business idea, what he means by chasing your curiosity instead of your passion, and much, much more. In light of our topic and our guest today, I've decided to put on sale at an 85% discount my Boss Free Virtual Summit. This is an online conference I hosted interviewing 30 plus entrepreneurs, all who went from working for somebody else to working for themselves. Included in those 30 plus interviews are over $1,500 in speaker bonuses. You get access to the original video interviews, also audio only versions of those interviews. Normally $497 for a boss free virtual summit, all access pass for a limited time, just $79. All you need to do is go to jeffbrown.me to get your lifetime all access pass to the boss free virtual summit. Again, just $79 for a limited time when you go to jeffbrown.me. That's jeffbrown.me. Steve Chu is a highly recognized influencer and speaker in the world of e-commerce and has taught thousands of students to profitably sell physical products online. His blog, mywifequitterjob.com, has been featured in Forbes, The New York Times, Entrepreneur, and MSNBC. He also runs the My Wife Quitter Job podcast, which is among the top 25 marketing shows on Apple Podcasts, and a YouTube channel with hundreds of thousands of subscribers. With his wife, he runs BumblebeeLinens.com and hosts an annual conference called the Sellers Summit. He carries both a bachelor's and a master's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University. His new book is called The Family First Entrepreneur, How to Achieve Financial Freedom Without Sacrificing What Matters Most. Well, Steve Chu, I am so excited to have you here and to talk about this book. Welcome officially to the Read to Lead podcast. I am very happy to be here, Jeff. So explain the riddle, the, riddle me this, Batman. Explain this to me. Electrical engineer to entrepreneur selling handkerchiefs. <laughs> how, do, how does this happen? <laughs> it is very random. <laughs> unplanned. And my parents were freaking out. <laughs> I bet they were. I mean, this all started because my wife wanted to quit her job and we live in an expensive area. Mm. That's really what it is. So we live in the Silicon Valley because I'm an electrical engineer. <laughs> uh, you pretty much need two incomes in a good school district. My wife was making six figures at the time as a financial analyst. She becomes pregnant with our first child. And she says, hey, I hate my job. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to stay home with the kids. I was fully on board with that because I didn't get to see my parents as much as I would have liked growing up. And uh, I didn't really want to cut back on the lifestyle. I didn't. I still wanted a good house and a good school district. Right. So we just brainstormed ways to, to make money on the side. And you mentioned handkerchiefs. The reason we came up with handkerchiefs was because when my wife and I got married, she's a crier. Like she cries at <laughs> all these occasions. Yeah. We paid an ungodly amount of money for photography and she didn't want to be in the photos, drying her tears with ratty tissues. Looked all over the place for handkerchiefs, couldn't find any anywhere mm. except for these factories in China, but you had to buy a whole bunch. So we bought a whole bunch, a couple hundred, used a handful of them, and we just liquidated them on eBay and then ended up selling like hotcakes. Mm. So when it came time, we were like, hey, why don't we revisit that handkerchief factory and, and just launch a store? And that's exactly what we did. Mm. And still going strong today, I understand, right? Yeah, it actually replaced her salary and profit in the first year, and it's been growing the double and triple digits since. Today, it's a seven-figure mm -hmm. business. 
We actually just bought a warehouse earlier this year also. Oh, wow. I've been familiar with your blog and have read posts from it, mywifequitherjob.com, over the years. But it wasn't until I opened your book that I realized, well, you were that guy. <laughs> I didn't know until I was like, oh, he's that guy. Okay, I know this guy. Uh, you mentioned your parents and your wife, and, and, and you, you dedicate the book to your parents, your kids, and your wife collectively. And as the author of a book about the importance of family, I've, I've got to ask, what, what does family mean to you ultimately? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it means different things to different people. For us, it's about a core of emotional support, love and trust, uh, financial, emotional, and social support. But mm. I think more importantly, what I lacked growing up was shared experiences, memories, and, and a history. In order to be able to have shared experiences, you have to really be present. Mm. I was fortunate growing up, although my, my father worked a lot and spent his evenings in front of the television, <laughs> mostly. Uh, my mom was very good. She, she was a stay-at-home mom for our younger years, and she was very good about the experiences part of it. You know, it wasn't just giving us things or you know, putting us off in a room or telling us to go outside and come back when, when it you know, gets dark, kind of, although there were those days as well. But she was very much about the experiences. And one of those experiences for me was going to the library mm. and, and developing a love for reading. And, and I attribute you know, what I do today in a large part. Uh, there's some others involved along the way, but it started, the impetus was, was my mom. Now, I, as I grew up and I went to school, school educated out of me the desire to want to learn and to want to read oddly. Uh, but it was, it, my mom planted that seed. Seth Godin helped rekindle it later. But uh, yeah, my mom was all about the experiences. So I, I definitely... Definitely identify with that. So my dad, uh, he came to the U.S. with nothing. So mm-hmm. he worked his way from the ground up. Uh, my mom was heavily into work also. She, she discovered a cure to a rare disease. So my, my parents are both very accomplished. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't that they didn't want to hang out. But, you know, you come here with nothing. Got to work your way up. I really sure. appreciate everything that they did for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, good save there. Good save. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> Well, let's let's have you sort of define then what family first entrepreneur really means. What what traits does this type of entrepreneur typically possess? Typically, when you think about a business, you think about an entity that's for profit. When you're a family first entrepreneur, you prioritize time over money. Mm-hmm. You're not trying to grow, grow, grow that business just to see as as large as you can build it. You also prioritize profit over revenue. Like if you follow like the stock market and the companies out there, a lot of times, like let's take Amazon, for example, for the longest time, they were losing money hand over fist. They were just trying to generate revenue, build a buzz. Family first entrepreneurs is like the complete opposite. Mm-hmm. You know approximately how much you need and your your goal is is really more free time. It doesn't have to be for family per se. It's just mm-hmm. time to do what you want to be doing, uh, time to be spending time with who you want to be spending time with. We've all heard the word uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship, especially the word hustle uh, kicked around quite a bit and some espouse that sort of way of, of, of that approach to entrepreneurship. Talk a bit about what you call the lies of, of hustle. You know, what's funny about this is the way I was brought up in an Asian household was you got to pay your dues. You got to do your time and good things will happen. And if you think about the way entrepreneurship is portrayed online, it's about hustling. It's about working 100-hour weeks. It's a badge of honor, paying your dues, doing your time. But what people don't really consider is that if you're hustling really hard right now and, and burning the midnight oil, you miss a lot of experiences along the way. So, And, and all of your efforts may not lead to the outcome that, that you have. Like I've interviewed a lot of millionaires and billionaires on my podcast, for example. And I remember interviewing this one billionaire and I was like, Hey, do you have any regrets? I mean, you're rich. You got a private jet and everything. He's like, yeah, I actually lost my wife and kids during this whole thing because I was just spending so much time in the business and I would give all this up in order to, to be back with them as a, as a family unit. Gosh. You know, there's a lot of talk about when it comes to solopreneurship in particular of following your passion and how if you just do that, everything else kind of falls into place. But what do you mean when you say and suggest to chase curiosity rather than passion? Yeah. So let's let's define that word real quick. So when I think of passion, I think of like like a girl you're really into, <laughs> right? You might be infatuated with her, but you know, passion kind of fades over time. Kind of like uh, I was really into baking souffles for a while, <laughs> and then I just got sick of eating them. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas if you chase curiosity, like 
If you look at your life, chances are there's something that, that you're really good at or you're really knowledgeable about that particular mm. aspect uh, of whatever it is. And you're knowledgeable for a reason. It's because you're curious about it. And when you have a lot of knowledge about a certain skill or task, you know that gives you a lot of inherent advantages mm. when it comes to business. So that's what that means, really. Mm. I've coached a lot of podcasters over the years and, and learned this from my days in radio too. And, and it's the importance of niching down and understanding you know, who your audience is, your target audience is. And I, I think though that, that many young entrepreneurs hear that and even understand that, but have a really tough time actually doing it. What would you say in your experience does niching down actually look like in practice? So I think the biggest objection that people have to niching down is, hey, I'm not reaching enough people. I think what people don't realize is that niching down is something you can start with and you can expand over time. Mm. Really niching down really just means speaking to a single person at first and just really standing out. Like if I focus my business strictly targeting you, Jeff, mm -hmm. books, read, delete, whatever, chances are I'm going to get you as a customer. And it's really about standing out. And then you build upon those, those victories. Niching down in the beginning doesn't mean that you have to niche down for the rest of your business career. Mm. You just need to get that initial foot in the door first and then gradually expand. It's kind of like uh, when Tesla launched, they launched with the Roadster, which catered mm. to a very specific high-end person. Mm. Then they introduced the Model S, you know, which attracted a certain type, and now they're going broad. What does it mean to work backwards from your customer's front in this, in this process? What does that look like? Yeah. So I think what most entrepreneurs tend to do is they come up with the product first and then they try to go find someone to buy it. Right. Right. And I had this problem too as an engineer. Like we like to build, people like to build things. <laughs> the phrase you just mentioned means finding something that's already in demand, what people want, and then find that group of people. Mm. So if you already know that something's in demand, it's pretty easy to find that person and where they hang out. For example, I have a, a friend whose 14 year old daughter sells opossum pins. Uh, she, she likes opossums, pretty random, right? And she mm -hmm. started designing these pins. And so she found out there was demand by looking on these Facebook groups. There are opossum Facebook groups out there. <laughs> Who knew? And, and people on that group were just looking for opossum designs and that sort of thing. And she mm -hmm. was a member of that group. And she's like, hey, maybe these people would, would want the pins because the demand is already there. Mm. So it's working backwards, yeah. essentially. Getting with the end in mind, as yeah. Covey would say. How would you recommend, or maybe you deal with this in, in dealing with clients uh, on a fairly regular basis, um, how would you recommend evaluating or validating someone's business idea to, to ensure that it's going to be a, one that works apart from what you just described in, in, in working yeah. in customer front? So e-commerce is what I specialize in, which is selling physical products online. And these days, there's a lot of tools that can actually help you gauge demand. For example, Amazon owns over 50% of e-commerce. There are tools out there like Jungle Scout, Helium 10, that can actually browse every listing on Amazon and tell you how much each of those listings are actually making online. Mm. So these days, you, you don't go in blind. Let's say you want to sell a widget. You can just search for that widget, see how many sellers are selling that widget, uh, which ones are getting the most sales, why are they standing out and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of research that you can do today before even spending a dime, mm. aside from buying the tool, of course. Right, right. I, I imagine you've probably uh, rubbed shoulders with James Clear a time or two, or at least know of him uh, if you've not met him. Um, and something he says in Atomic Habits, one of my favorite quotes is, is we don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. And I think that also applies to the systems inside our business. Uh, you mentioned some tools. Talk about how specifically systems and automations can really ramp things up uh, if, you're, if you're doing it intentionally. First off, I love James Clear. Uh, we actually spent uh, three days together on, on this mancation. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> very, very brilliant guy. Okay. So I want to mention a couple of things that are somewhat unique viewpoints that I have in regards mm -hmm. to this. I think the tendency for most business owners is to just throw people and mm -hmm. money at a problem, right? Actually, throwing people at a problem is, is the first thing that comes to mind. Just hire someone to do things mm -hmm. and whatnot. I, I don't know if it's because I have an engineering background or whatnot, but my systems that I always try to implement involve code and just computer automation. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, so in our store, we sell wedding handkerchiefs. So you wouldn't think that we get a lot of repeat business. But what we do is we have these automated email flows in place so mm -hmm. that if someone buys something, 
depending on what they bought, we automatically send them a separate email sequence cross-selling other items. Mm. Let me give you an example. So in our store, we sell cocktail napkins, lunch napkins, and dinner napkins, and they're all matching. If someone buys cocktail napkins, but not the other two, it triggers an email that automatically says, hey, did you know we offer matching napkins to those cocktail napkins that you might want in case Mm. you're throwing a party? I think hiring someone to do a task is probably the most expensive way to do it. I mean, sometimes it can't be helped, but these days there's so many plugins, there's so many software tools that can help you automate a lot of things. And the other concept that I that I take with my business is I like to do one thing and reap the benefits of that one task for a long time. So for example, you won't see me on social media as much because my friends who are good at social media on Instagram, for example, she posts seven times per day. I have a friend on Facebook who's very successful, posts 21 times per day. And guess what? If you stop, the traffic stops. Mm -hmm. And you contrast that to like a blog post. You mentioned you've read my blog in the past. Mm -hmm. Some of those posts I've written 10 years ago still generate me free traffic today. Mm -hmm. On YouTube, a lot of these videos that I filmed years ago still generate views and leads and traffic. Mm -hmm. So I like to focus on, on leveraging my work. To the, to the maximum ability. Yeah. And you're right. And in podcasting, similarly, you know, I've got episodes that are 10 years old that still get listened to today, but you're right. Social media, Facebook, Instagram, it's here for a, just a blink of an eye and then nobody ever sees it again. <laughs> I mean, that's not to say it's not a great strategy and for certain things it, it is, but I always think of those avenues as more of like a hamster wheel. Right. Right. Yeah. It's something you can't get off of. Yeah. Or yeah. Very, very easily. Anyway, there's a lot of things still we could talk about in your book. But I especially enjoyed the uh, quitting is just the beginning section, the very last section of the book. When you talk about your kids, share a bit about the impact of you and your wife's example as entrepreneurs on your children. You know, it's funny, and I don't know if this is the case with your kids, Jeff, but my kids, they, they tend to copy things that we do. I like my son, for example, he's skinny as a beanpole. <laughs> uh, he copies the fact that I don't eat carbs, I think. <laughs> but he needs carbs, but I can't eat them. Otherwise I'm going to gain weight. Mm. So I I think over the years, them watching us run our businesses has really inspired them to want to run their own. So Mm. the two of them actually started a business together when they were nine and 11 years old, (laughs) selling entrepreneurship t-shirts. And uh, it actually made, you know, uh, over a thousand bucks, which is a lot of money for a nine, 11 year old. And I think that all got started because my wife decided to run an entrepreneurship fair at the elementary school. And uh, they just kind of ran with it and put up a website. They were making all their t-shirts by hand in the beginning. Mm. And that later led to print on demand. My daughter's already running her second store, which is selling her handmade jewelry. Mm. And she's actually in the process of creating an online course mm. that's teaching other people how to sell on Etsy. So this is again, where, where the family and the shared experiences come into play. I think just by being present, the kids just want to oftentimes be like you. And if you can provide like a positive influence in that respect, good things will happen. Mm. I've got a niece uh, who's just turned 18 that I'm, I can't believe she's 18, I'm, <laughs> that I'm very excited about passing your book along to. Uh, she's very entrepreneurial and creates a lot of her own stuff that she's gone to different fairs to sell and, and hasn't hit the inflection point of you know jumping online and broadening her, her customer base that way, which I think could be very lucrative for her if, if she did. There's still a lot from the book that we could touch on. We don't have time to, to hit on every point, but what would you say I've not asked you about, Steve, that you want to make sure people know about uh, from the book and want to get across? I think one thing that uh, needs to be emphasized is that if you decide to start a business and you're not used to making a lot of money all at once, mm-hmm. like I remember when we launched our business, all of a sudden we started making way more than my salary. Like when, when I quit my job, I think I was making like 10x more than my engineering job. Mm. When that happens, what often happens is you get this fever. <laughs> all of a sudden you, you're intoxicated with this money that's coming and you want more of it, even though you don't need it. So I used to start setting these ridiculous goals like, great, we made 100K in our first year. Let's try to grow that 50%. And then we grow it. And then I'd set bigger and bigger goals every year, I think just for ego purposes. <laughs> you know, and I was in these mastermind groups. Uh, if, if your audience isn't familiar with that, it's basically just a cohort of people, entrepreneurs who meet and help each other. Mm. And I'd hear about my friends growing, you know, 200%. So I'd be like, all right, well, if my friend can do it, I can do it. And then I ended up just driving my wife crazy. And meanwhile, we're very frugal people. We don't even spend 
a small portion of what we make. So what was the point of making more and more and more money? And so I, I would just caution your listeners to just expect that to happen. Because I think overcoming the ego is the hardest part of business. Because I know that if I wanted to blow up my Bumblebee Linens, which is my e-commerce store, for example, I know I could blow that up. But at what expense would that happen? And you that's why it's always very important to remember why you started the business in the first place, and then find something that will satisfy that ego. So, so for me, the way I operate is I do one thing every single year, and I focus on that one thing. So this year was the launch of the book. Uh, last year, it was YouTube. The year before that, it was TikTok. Every year, I find one thing to just kind of engross myself into. Mm. And that's what I found has satisfied my ego. As I read the book and read about some of that story that you shared and the uh, come to Jesus meeting <laughs> that you and your wife ultimately had, I was worried. I'm like, is this marriage? Does this marriage last? Are they still married today? Are they? You know, I'm saying all those kind of things. <laughs> Glad to hear that that the that, that you are. Uh, so uh, you 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 fixed it before it got out of hand. But I, I I totally get that. I'm very much an achiever type on the Enneagram. I'm a three, and I would be right there with you, wanting to set goals, stretch goals, you know, doing things that are far beyond, as you said, what is really necessary. And, and think back to why you started this in the first place. It's not to you know wear yourself out to the point that you, like your wife got to, or you just don't enjoy it anymore. Um, you've got to recognize those signs. That's probably one of the most valuable things that comes from the book. I mean, it's after all, it's the family first entrepreneur. Well, we actually just celebrated our 20-year wedding anniversary yesterday, in fact. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. That is Thanks. awesome. Well, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions not related to the book, if I may. Okay. Uh, yeah. The first one I'd like to ask uh, is related to books. And that's just uh, some recommendations for, for books that you've particularly enjoyed and, and got a lot from over the years that maybe have impacted you in some way. So I always like books that have to do with psychology. Mm. Maybe it's because I was an electrical engineer and my job during the day was literally to stare at a monitor <laughs> all day long. And I think I lacked those skills coming out because I was an engineer. So that's mm. why I'm fascinated by it. Mm. And probably my all-time favorite book is Influenced by Robert Cialdini. And I can attest that the principles in those books probably catapulted mywifequitterjob.com mm. to seven figures. Oh wow! Because of the principles, because I didn't, I didn't know those principles, and I'm not sure if you're. I'm sure your audience, a lot of them, has probably read that book. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we have to talk about James Clear's Atomic Habits. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, because of him, actually, I have a pull-up bar right outside of my bathroom. <laughs> yeah. And so whenever I need to go to the bathroom, I just do pull-ups. It's like this fixed routine that I have now, right? Uh, I think having habits, it's it's a lot like systems, right? The habits that you create is what's going to propel you forward. And then another book is How to Win Friends and Influence People. They all have similar themes. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask you lastly, just about how you manage your personal knowledge. We've gone from information scarcity to information abundance to what I would argue is now information uh, superabundance, which is almost like scarcity because when information is super abundant, uh, it, it can be just as hard to find and to deal with as when it was scarce. And so to sort of attack that, uh, something I do is, is a, a fairly regular cohort called Note Making Mastery, where we learn how to better collect the information that's coming at us every day, how to connect new ideas to existing ideas as they come in and organize those ideas, how to crystallize those into our own thoughts, uh, and then how to ultimately create with those building blocks. Uh, I'd love to know what, if any, strategies or, or even tactics you use to just kind of keep track of what you learn such that it doesn't you know, end up one ear and out the other eventually. So for me, the best way to learn is by doing, because, because if I just pick up and like read a book or whatnot and don't apply it, mm -hmm. it does go in one ear and out the other. Yeah. Uh, let me give you an example. I, I had a coding project that I needed to make and I, it involved learning a new language. If I just picked up the book on learning that new programming language, I would have forgotten everything. But the fact that I had an application that I needed to develop mm -hmm. now made me solidify that knowledge in my head. In terms of sorting through all the different sources of information today, what I tend to do now is I'll tend to just pay for a class from someone that I trust because there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. It, really, it's about picking someone that you trust at this point. You're right. Information is free and everywhere. But if you look at my YouTube feed and my Facebook feed, there are these commercials from these 18-year-old kids always pitching me millions of dollars without doing any work, right? <laughs> can't trust anything these days. So you got to find someone that you trust and, and then just pay for their, their class. Mm, well said. 
Well, the book again from Steve Chu is called The Family First Entrepreneur, How to Achieve Financial Freedom Without Sacrificing What Matters Most. Uh, Steve, delight to talk to you. Love the book. I highly recommend it. And uh, we're working on having Steve as our sort of book club selection, his book uh, for December. So look forward to that and your invitation to actually ask Steve questions yourself. It's not just me doing the interviewing. You get to do some interviewing too. Steve, thank you again for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. More details on this interview and our chat today with Steve Chu can be found on the show notes page for this episode. That's at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 505 for episode 505. There you'll find links to the resources we talked about and ways to connect with Stephen online if you choose. And don't forget about that special limited time 85% off deal on my boss free virtual summit, that online conference I hosted, 30 plus interviews. $1,500 $1,500 in speaker bonuses and more. Right now, 85% off, normally $497. You can get it for just $79 when you go to jeffbrown.me. Next time on the podcast, I'll be welcoming author Bob TD in a book he co wrote with Michael Marquardt called Leading with Questions How Leaders Discover Powerful Answers by Knowing How and What to Ask. Again, that's next time on the Read to Lead podcast. Hope to see you next time. Until then, as always, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.